goodness, it's good to be back for me at least, maybe not for you. For the past couple of days, Mrs. Kimball and I were traveling to Pennsylvania, and we did some speaking at a camp, and we realized that we really, really missed uh, some of you. Uh, we missed some of you a lot. For those of you who are new, uh, we want to know that this is a place where you can be welcome. And over the course of the year, we're going to discuss some different things throughout Scripture in the hopes that God would reveal himself to you uh, and that you would feel connected and welcome here. What I've done is, and at a point in time not too far ago, I was new here as well. Uh, so what I've done is I've compiled a list of about five things that you need to know to survive. Living in Florida and then also surviving King's Academy. The first one, if you hear a hissing sound behind bushes, it is not a well-organized group of synchronized anacondas that are about to bite your ankles. It's a sprinkler system. Running and yelling is not the correct response. Number two, no matter how persuasive the gentleman or lady may be in the Walmart parking lot, the mixtape they try and sell you will not meet your expectations. It won't. Number three, sunburn. Number four, sunburn is a real reality. Maybe not for some of you. Number four, get to class on time. Number five, forget number five, we'll find it. Number five, possums are even uglier after you've caught them. And number five, number six, I can't count, it's one I'm after you. Number six, never, ever, ever tell athletics you're all in for a pet rally. Uh, Skippy McFluff or Nutter may be in your future. It just, don't tell them you're all in, that's a bad idea. I was supposed to work the light, somehow I ended up here. I dropped my back trying to run. It's not a good thing. One other final detail I learned when I first came to Florida was this little thing called gated communities. In Pittsburgh, uh, if you live in a gated community, you're either a pirate or not a real pirate, like a Pittsburgh pirate. I don't know why you think it'd be a real pirate, but a pirate, a penguin, or a stealer. Like, you're somebody fancy if you live in a gated community. So when I came out here, everyone that lived in a gated community, I thought was like walking around all the time, like, Roger, where's the lobster? Like, that's what it <laughs> That's why I assumed the conversation was like right behind that fancy gate until I realized that literally every neighborhood has a gate. Like, it says almost nothing about where you live, that there's a gate there. We live where there's a gate, and half the time you could literally just push it and it would open. But I always imagined what it would be like to live behind the gated community. And one time, I was a youth pastor just down the road, and a student uh, texted me and said, hey, I need to ride a youth group. I live in such and such a neighborhood. So they told me a certain neighborhood, and I thought, all right, I can, I can, I can do this. I didn't know there was a gate at first. I pulled around the corner, and I saw there was a gate there. At first, you know where the story's going to go. At first, the gate was wide open. And so what I thought was, oh, they're welcoming to all people. So what I'll do is I'll just floor it full speed, I'll floor it full speed, and then the gate will stay open, and I'll pop up like, Roger, where's the lobster? Where's the lobster Roger? That's what I thought was going to happen. So I floored it right past the guard gate, uh, guard shack. It's not a shack, it's actually a pretty nice building. And I floored it. And I was like a few decent ways away, and I saw the gate start to close. And I thought, oh, no. He closes, he closes, he closes. I slam on my brakes. And I'm like, all right, I am without options. I put it in reverse and backed up to the gate. And, and the lady's like, it's impossible to look innocent at this point because I floored my car into the gate, <laughs> contemplated, like, could I take it out, like, to Narnia in the north, like, or should I just put it in reverse and end up back at the guard gate? I ended up at the guard gate and I, I said, look, I'm here to pick up my friend, which is not what you should say. <laughs> Which is not what you should say at all, because that's not very convincing. Like, hey, I'm at the gate, and I'm here to pick up my friend. Like, okay, everyone has a friend. And I looked disheveled, because it's Florida, and it's hot. And I was sweaty, because it's Florida, and it's hot. And I was probably listening to R&D, because it's Florida, and hot. And the windows were down, and I was in my normal car. And I'm talking to the lady, and I'm like, his name is Ryan, but I can't remember what his last name is like. I can't make this up. I can't remember, like, how to spell or pronounce his last name. It's one of those impossible ones. And it's, it's like, like Schwinn and Schwinn and his vet, or something, something like that. And so I'm like trying to convince her that like I know somebody. And she's like, well, you know the address. And I didn't know where he lived. I knew like the rough neighborhood. I didn't know where he lived. I didn't know his last name. I had zero answers. And she took my ID and it's kind of going like this whole number, like, well, you can't come in if you don't know like his last name or his address. And so I started to do this, like, sir, we're gonna have to ask you to leave. So I had like thought about just like, like looping around and coming back and like breaking a different accent or changing my shirt like oh, I'm here. and then it didn't work so i just kept like kind of hanging out and calling ryan and for some reason it didn't seem like he was getting my calls and i was stuck outside of the gate 
Um, in a silly story, I was stuck outside of the gate, but I think a lot of us seem kind of disconnected in the same sort of way. That there's a lot of us feel like we're allowed in, but at an arm's length. Like you're allowed in somewhere, but you're technically kept outside. You know what it feels like to be lonely in a very real sense. And some of us say, all right, kid, well, um, if I don't feel lonely, this message doesn't apply to me. But there's something deep within us that feels like something's gotten inside of the control system and messed with the way we're designed to function. There's something inside of every single one of us, whether we believe in God or not, that feels like we've been accepted, but somehow we're still held at a distance. There's a moment in the life of Jesus that caught my attention. Uh, this summer that I want to share with you. I, I can feel it within myself, this story, as though I read it for the first time. It says, um, Jesus was traveling uh, through a town, Luke 5, 12 to 16. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. Jesus enters the town and encounters a guy who's covered with leprosy. The first thing we know about this man is his issue. A lot of us know what it feels like to have our identity, or who we are, be preceded, or what goes before it is our issue. A lot of us know what it feels like to have what we have done or what has been done to us go before who we are as a person. This person's left nameless in the book of histories because their issue seems to be too big. So the very first thing we know about this person is that they're known for what they do and not who they are or what's happened to them. And so Jesus enters the town. There's a man who's covered with leprosy. You have to imagine the scenario. I'll paint it for you so you can see it very real. This man would have been most likely bloody, most likely covered in lesions and boils. His skin would have been decaying, and it's possible that his body was breaking down. He would have walked with a limb. He would have had to have separated himself at least 50 paces. I was curious because I want to illustrate it for you clearly. 50 paces for me. And I would have been slightly taller than the average person back then. 50 paces for me was from that door to that door. The full length of the gym. 50 paces removed from anyone else. Moved to the wilderness. They would technically be required if I was coming towards you to yell, I'm clean, I'm clean. That everything about this guy, as he moved closer towards other people, screamed that he was not worthy. 50 paces away. It says, Jesus came along this man 50 paces away. In addition, not only was he required to be that far away, he was also required to cover his face. And so to hide his deformity, his disease, his blood, the, the mess that was his condition, he was required to put a screen over his face. I think you know what that feels like, too. Instagram, everything has not created the idea of filtering who you really are. It's long ago that they were required to cover up who they were. God has a hard time blessing the person you pretend to be. So the man walks and he's got his face covered. We think, imagine it's 50 paces he's required to keep distance from someone else. And he makes his way closer to Jesus. And we get into verse 13, right? That second half of verse 12, which says, He came to a man with leprosy, and when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face to the ground and begged him. Notice this man makes his way 50 steps. What would it have been like if you were in the crowd? You know this man is not supposed to be near anybody else. And he has to make 50 steps. Let's imagine it's from this Lord to Mr. Cola. 50 steps. If I stay there, I will die. If I make it to this Jesus who may be able to heal me, maybe I'll make it. He makes the steps 50, 49, 48, 47, all the way down, and he keeps walking. And the scenario I imagine is the closer he gets to Jesus, the more willing people are to push away from him. Because the more honest you are about your situation, the more people will spread away. And the more you will find our understanding of God is that he steps closer to you, but not farther away. So he continues walking closer. And almost to, to clarify that everyone else is far away, this man fully acknowledges that this is life and death scenario. For if Jesus can't do anything for him, they are required by law to kill him. Imagine him yelling, unclean, unclean. He can't even walk right because his legs have stopped functioning like they were supposed to, but he's making his way. He makes his way, and there's no doubt in his life that he is no longer living. He is just existing until he gets to Jesus. It's hard for us sometimes to receive what God gives us because we're convinced we already have it. It's hard for us to receive from God what he offers us, because I think I already possess it. God comes to us and he says, I'm going to give you hope and peace. You say, what hope and peace do I need? I have it already. 
When God offers us life, sometimes we say, I don't know, I'm interested because I have my own. The reality that we see in this person as he makes his way to Jesus is that he knew he was not living but merely existing. The biggest step in your journey this year may be realizing that without God, you are merely existing and not living. So this man makes his way to Jesus and he asks a fundamental question in the form of a statement, but we have all asked this question. He falls on his face and he asks this, this, this he makes a statement. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Don't, don't, it should be up there. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. What is he asking? He's standing there and he says, I have nothing. I have nothing to offer you. Everyone has seen me to be unworthy and undeserving. I will die if you don't do anything for me. If you are willing. He is not asking if God is able to. He's asking if God wants to. A lot of us have asked that question. If God truly existed... He would have done something in my life to make his presence very clear. It's the same question. God, if you, if you really cared, if you really existed, you would have done something for my condition. And this man, with his face in the ground, stands apparently within arm's distance of Jesus. And I'm so excited to introduce you to what Jesus says to him next. It says that he looked down at the man, and we find this spot. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Before Jesus spoke to him, he was willing to touch him. Did the man who was sick with leprosy, did he ask to be touched? No. Jesus was willing to do something that showed that he was in the same position as this man, 50 steps. He asked to be clean. He did not ask to be touched. Think about all the times in Scripture where Jesus does miracles, but he doesn't touch someone. Like he speaks to someone and then something happens. Or he's able to perform a miracle through some means besides touching. But for some moment, God in Jesus chose to make it very clear that he was going to touch this man. Now, unless you envision that God is, that Jesus is super flexible and just reaches down and touches his toes, that's as flexible as I am. You would have to envision that this dude is laying on the ground before him. Jesus has to get down on one knee or maybe two knees in order to touch this man. And in an instant, everyone around him sees what has just happened. And the ministry of Jesus should have ended here. Because by the law, if I touch somebody, if I touch somebody who's unclean, I am now unclean. But what you find with God is that no matter your filter, no matter your yelling, no matter your distance, no matter what it is, the moment that you touch God, he does, you don't make him unclean, he makes you clean. The way it was supposed to work is that the unclean makes the clean unclean. But when the unclean touches the truly clean, the unclean now becomes clean. The impure doesn't have as much power as Jesus. Let me illustrate it this way. This is, you've probably been wondering what this is for. It's really Gatorade. Let's imagine it's not Gatorade. Let's imagine this is filled with some sort of deadly, deadly virus. And within this container, uh, it can't hurt us, technically. It's not really risky because it's not airborne yet. It hasn't been instilled. So I imagine if this remains untouched, it seems less deadly. We all agree? It seems less deadly. If I don't touch it, if I leave it there and nothing happens, it seems less deadly. Well, let's imagine that it exists on the edge. And let's imagine that I possess a different bottle. That gets, I'm really nervous about that, actually. Don't jump or laugh. Or anything will move. Let's imagine I have a different bottle. And this bottle, it's risky, but this bottle has all the power to get rid of what was broken in here. Now the decision has to be made. What do I do? Do I leave it untouched, still containing death? Or am I willing to risk my reputation and the safety of us all and open up the bottle to cleanse it? I contain all the power. I have to choose what to do with the death that's inside. So what happens is Jesus, in a very willing way, bends down physically and also spiritually to pick up a man. Your teachers would know what this feels like. To have a God who's going to get low to pick you up. So he reaches down and we're back in this moment. Notice he's willing to touch him before he speaks at him or to him. So he's got his hand on the man and it says immediately the leprosy left him. There's miracles that take Jesus like three, four rounds. There's miracles where he doesn't have to touch them. And there's miracles that aren't as definitive, but this one is for everyone to see. Remember the group that separated so the man can walk across those 50 paces. Now they're seeing 
that what he has done has changed everything. Can I speak to a fear right now? Or can I speak to reality? And in this room, dozens of you don't believe that maybe supernatural exists. Hundreds of you. And so the idea that I just said leprosy stopped because a man touched somebody, that just doesn't, that doesn't make sense in your worldview. Can I say you are welcome and this book is written to you? Luke is the author of this book, wrote to a man named Theophilus. He says, many have taken to give an account of what Jesus has done that you may believe, and I am doing the same, that what you have heard you may have certainty about. Do you know that the Bible is written to people who doubt? Who were found on the cusp of not believing? And for some reason, Luke chooses to include this story because something powerful happens in this moment. It says immediately the leprosy left him. He walked 50 steps, he fell on his face, and Jesus touched him. You say, that's not my situation, though. Like, I am comfortable where I am, and I don't feel like I've ever walked 50 steps to anything to find satisfaction and peace. Every person in this room has walked 50 steps and far more in the pursuit of things they thought would make their soul holy again. I have walked 50 steps in the hopes that I would find satisfaction and peace. You have walked 50 steps in the wrong direction. You walked 60. 70, trying to find the thing. The question is not whether or not you are walking. The question is, at the end of the day, will your walking have been worth it? Making 50 steps. It's not the quantity or the difficulty of your steps that matter. It's the direction that determines whether they're worth it or not. The sin lost to Jesus falls down and gets healed. And what Jesus says next will surprise you. It's not what I would have said, but I'm not Jesus. He says, don't tell anyone. Jesus says to the man, don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. If you were Jesus, you just did something awesome. Wouldn't you want everyone to know? Like, wouldn't you think that would help you? What would happen if he reoriented this man back to his family? The touch of Jesus, the loss of leprosy, man, he could go touch his child again. And he could go work again. Wouldn't you have wanted, wouldn't you have wanted people to know? But if he had let everyone know, it would have been chaos. And there's a likelihood that this man would not have been restored to the full completion of what God had for him. For they wouldn't have been able to clarify him as technically clean. Let me tie it back to you this way. If this man gets healed, he may or may not, if he hasn't gone to the priest, he may or may not be able to go back to his family. Because they may not know he's clean. God, when he saves you, God, when, he's reached, when he reaches down to touch you, has your full life in mind. And he is not limited by what you see. So he says, don't go down to tell anybody. Because they'll think that all I am trying to do is heal the disease that you think you know about. Don't go tell anybody because I'm here to save something deeper. The way that this story ends is beautiful and also weird. It says, don't go tell anybody. Uh, but go to the priests as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more, so the crowds came to hear him and be healed of their sicknesses. And look what Jesus does at the end. But Jesus often withdrew to a lonely place and he prayed. You just healed somebody in a miraculous way. Would you go to the middle of nowhere, to what the Bible calls a lonely place? Other gospels call it a wilderness, but every gospel that tells this story includes that he goes away. Do you remember where our story started? With somebody who is outside the gate. Someone who is kept at arm's length. Someone who is in the wilderness. And now you have the person who stooped low and was willing to touch them. Who now willingly goes to the wilderness so the person in the wilderness can come to the city. In the story, I was uh, stuck at the gate with my friend Ryan Schwitzman, whatever his last name was. And I couldn't get in. Here's what I did. I called him, and at once he seemed to like he didn't answer, and I was getting nervous, so I did another loop. Eventually I got a hold of him, and I was like, dude, what's your address? And for some reason it seemed like like I couldn't actually like communicate it. Maybe I'm not that smart. But I couldn't like hear what he was saying and he communicated to the lady and like also couldn't spell his last name. So it just wasn't working. Eventually we came to the conclusion that he would have to come out to the gate with his quick. That's just what happened. With his clicker to let me in. The truth of the Christian faith is that God will come from the inside out to take you in. I was sitting in a sweaty car that didn't belong in the neighborhood, and I didn't even know the right answer.
answers or the right names or anything. He was willing to come out and get me and bring me back in. When, when God intervenes in your life, you'll find the same thing to be true. No other religion says that God moves towards mess and takes on mess in himself so that other people can be made whole. There, I've talked to way too many of you to believe this is true. This is absolutely true about you, that a lot of you feel disconnected. God like said in the beginning that there's something inside the control system of your life that's made you disconnected from other people and also the you you were intended to be. We see in this story a beautiful picture of God who encounters another person. And it takes them from the inside out and brings them in. You know, uh, when, when Jesus reaches down and touches the man, he answers forever and for all times, who am I willing to there is nobody in the history of humanity that has appeared more broken and unworthy than this man. What he did with this bottle was highly dangerous. But the fact that he could heal changed everything. The fact that he went to the cross for you and for me proved that he was willing for all time, forever, to go from the inside out to pull us in. So the question is, um, are you willing? I know you, I know you could exist, but do you want to heal me? I can't say it any clearer that God wants to heal you. That God wants to connect you with those people who are around you. Right here, right now. I'm going to pray for us real quick, and then we'll dismiss the teachers. If there's a conversation you need to have, please stay after. We'd love to talk to you. And then we'll dismiss you to your next period. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word. We're grateful that every time that we tried to push away, you were still there. You are still available. And when I was at the gate and didn't have any answers, you came out to me. And it was only because you were willing to come to me that I was able to go in. And I, just, I see us as the lever in the story. That our identity is preceded by our issues. We filter ourselves. And you don't bless the, the us that we pretend to be. You bless us. And you call us. So I pray right now that whatever the loneliness or the brokenness, you would speak right through it. And whether we're new or this is our 12th year, whatever sort of baggage we're playing, none of it contain more power than your power to make us clean again. I'm so grateful for your word and grateful for what you're going to do this year as we study. We pray all this in Jesus.